All right. Hello, everyone. I I am still clicking the buttons. Mm. We we are live. I just don't have audio software open yet. Oh, f recording. Yeah. Yeah, but we are live at this unusual date and time. Yeah, so thank you everyone for your patience. Usual time, unusual so day. Usual, yeah, yeah. I uh, I went on vacation last week and I have a severe allergy to the protein produced by the rubber tree that is used in rubber and latex and that a ton of different fruits have cuz they're genetically related to the oh. rubber tree and I don't know what all I got into, but it was a lot. And right. Sunday night, my, my husband, he did not go with me on this vacation because sometimes life just gets the better of you. So Annie and I went on vacation. And and um, he got a Quest 3 uh, VR headset while I was gone. And he was showing off its ca capabilities by casting everything up to the TV set. And he's looking around the room and I'm seeing the paintings he's created, the plants he's added to the room. And sitting on the sofa is a troll. And I was like, what's the troll? And then I realized it was me. Oh, God. And... And it was a combination of my hair was a wild mess because I just like I took a shower and got out of the shower without brushing it and just did the towel dry thing. So like Medusa hair is going on. But my face was so swollen that I didn't recognize myself the first time, couple of times oh. I looked around. And I was like, this this is not going on air. This right, no. right. We'll, get, we'll give that a day for the swelling to decrease. Yeah. And so I yeah. still don't quite look myself but i can hide much behind glasses so i'm going to it, hide behind my glasses it's like it's insidious how that latex is in so many things you brush up against some soft oh foam padding getting onto a bus and there's probably latex in there you there's particles coming off of the tires like it's just everywhere like you're probably breathing it right like you're driving along the road yeah. you're probably breathing particles from tires like there once there are... this thing is an is a allergen to you yeah it's just a non-stop insult to your body so so it's a progressive allergy which means every single time i'm exposed to rubber my reaction will get more extreme it's like bees bee stings do this to people and there, there are people in one of the support groups that I'm in where we're basically like, where do you go to buy socks? These are things you worry about. Right. And their allergy is so bad that people can't come into their house with shoes on because the soles of most shoes are made of rubber. And they, they can't ride bikes the, except with like very specialized tires and everything. I'm not that extreme yet, but... Right. Disney World is completely safe for the most part. That's amazing. They they work a lot with Make a Wish. They 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 make a con. It costs a bloody fortune, yeah. but it's safe. Yeah. Universal not so much. Right. So on one of the rides, the nice foamy stuff they have around the lap bar you pull down. My leg touched up against it, and where my leg skin touched it just insta blistered and looked like a burn wow yeah so i'm apparently never going to universal studios again right right but uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah disney does take that pretty seriously if oh, you yeah. like look at the at the plants like if you look at the landscaping yeah everything is edible yeah so yeah. all of the plants are like very you know ornamental cabbages and <laughs> kale and and really just, like like you could you know if you didn't bring enough food for for <laughs> you know bring enough money for food you could nibble and not die and you might not be you know well nourished but you're not going right. to die and so they clearly take an attitude of like how do we make this place safe for everybody I and when you're at Disney, if you say they have a I have a food allergy on everything where it's like the first words out of the people at the restaurants are, does anyone at this table have a food allergy? And when you say yes and hang your head in shame, which is my natural response, they're like, don't worry about it. We'll have the chef come out. We'll figure it out. And I'm like, OK, I can't have citrus. I can't have tomatoes. I can't have dairy. And and like I clearly start to get the panic look on my face at this point. And the chefs at Disney are like, challenge accepted. 
Which thing <laughs> looks the tastiest to you? I will adapt this so you can eat it. Oh, that's amazing. And the attitude is just amazing. At yeah. Universal, they were like, yeah, you can't eat all of these things. We'll have someone come out and refund your money for you. Yeah. Yeah. Here's your French. <laughs> Here's your French. You know, my wife is vegan, and that's awesome conversation you know we'll go someone will be like oh i want to take you guys for dinner and then we'll go to some restaurant and you look through it and there's french fries yeah yeah that's yeah. all you're left with and yeah. and don't think about what else was cooked in the oil that the french fries were cooked in and yeah it's it's rough uh yeah. straying off the uh the path all right uh we're gonna proceed <laughs> with today's episode of astronomy cast are you ready to record I guess so. Just to warn the audience, I had like multiple existential crises preparing for this episode because I learned things that somehow I never <laughs> learned in history class. Um, I have one yeah. more window I need to remember to open. Okay. Hold on. Tell when you're ready. Ah, so many windows to open. <sighs> Almost there, folks. Almost there. I just want to be able to thank our patrons. We love you, patrons. I just have to find <laughs> Paul fire. Disney saying, I have a buddy who's allergic to almond skins. The chef at a Disney restaurant was absolutely giddy at the idea of a new allergy to work around. What a great attitude. Yeah, it really, right? really is. Like challenge accepted. This sounds like fun. Let me see what I can do. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I I I went to the seafood restaurant they have a couple of years. I went to the seafood restaurant they have a couple of years ago and I was like, I can't have any citrus this means no lemon and i can't have any tomato and the chef was like okay so we have a relish that we make that contains both of those things but i think i could make a berry relish that may be super weird on fish but we're gonna try it and it was she was like i'm not gonna charge you for this but i want to try this oh and that's she, amazing she like made relish out of blueberries and it tasted good and oh that's great well, of course yeah you can't go wrong with blueberries. So you can you really can but that's a oh, different all right. story for a different all right day. all right all right different all right day. i have found all the things i okay. i'm ready to press that record yeah. button and yep. that record button and you're recording i am also i am also recording yes all right uh oh yeah oh my god what i didn't write my intro <laughs> okay, I am I am pressing stop. I am pressing stop. Yeah, stop for a second. All right. right. Now right. you're going to watch the sausage get made. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so the moral of the story is I had a great time at Disney. I probably spent an entire paycheck in one week. Um, and I'm not paid weekly. <laughs> but it was worth it to be someplace where I didn't have to fear for my life because my allergy could kill me. And the one day I spent at Universal Studios taught me I am never going back. But hey, I got to ride the Velocicoaster, and that was kind of worth it. The Velocicoaster kind of is awesome, and I kind of adore dinosaurs in every possible way. And as Mythtown is pointing out in the chat over on Twitch, um, I saw a giraffe wearing a palm tree as a hat, and this brought me no end of joy. Um, so, uh, yeah... The Disney Animal Kingdom Lodge was a bucket list item that I have now checked off my bucket list. So the next thing I need to try and accomplish is staying in a hotel where I can watch Northern Lights overnight. So that is that is the next thing on my bucket list challenge. I didn't hear a word you said. I'm sure it was interesting. Are you ready to record? Yes, I am pressing okay. record. You want to see an Aurora? I, I do. I want to stay in one of those igloo hotels. Mm. Where you just lay on your back, bundled in a blanket, looking up, and the sky does yeah. its thing. I want to build one of those. I want to build a dome. Yeah. A yurt. That I, that you, well, not a yurt exactly. I want like a like a glass dome uh -huh. that you can lie underneath, put a put a mattress underneath, and be protected from the bugs, and and watch the sky. In and also keep it. Like you could bring like a space heater in in the middle oh, of the yeah. winter. Yeah, and and watch the sky on a, on a dark night, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure exactly how you maintain ventilation and keep the thing warm and so on and so forth, but I'm I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. Um, all right, here we go. I'm ready to record. Okay, I am recording. Okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast episode seven oh six, China's space program. 
Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. I, I am uh, happy to be back from the vacation, and I'm reminded of why people go on vacations and highly recommend doing this at least yes. once a decade. So you often have name dropped Dr. Adam Reese as the one of the people working on the Hubble tension. Yeah. Trying to measure the distance to Cepheid variables with yeah. unparalleled precision has now got his hand on the James Webb Space Telescope. Well, I finally got a chance to interview him and we talked about the work that he did in the Hubble Space Telescope to get his Nobel Prize. As and, a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and what it's been like getting his hands on James Webb and the yeah. work that he's been able to do and sort of the future of measuring distance in the universe. And it's, you know, everyone's always about theory and and Adam Reese is about did we is the is the yardstick correct? Right? So like I want to yeah. check the ruler one more time and has just done just incredible work and yeah. sort of is deeply aware and thinks about about how we measure distance in the universe and knows that that a lot of current theories of cosmology and stuff rely on 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 the work that he does and his team. And so it was a fascinating interview. Like it's one I'm most proud of in recent memory. So if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to my podcast and it'll be a fairly recent interview depending on on when you're listening to this if you're not listening to the universe today podcast by the way there are well over a thousand episodes containing interviews and question shows and all the stuff that i do it's also available on on youtube as well and i just like finished the interview and i was just like wow what a conversation so great so i'm just that's it i'm just so excited about being able to talk to people like adam reese about the hubble tension and james <laughs> webb and all that stuff amazing that's and it and I just want to say, else, it, if you enjoy this show, if you enjoy Universe Today, if you enjoy Escape Velocity Space News, leave a review. It costs you <laughs> nothing except for a few minutes. And that does more to get us in front of mm. more eyes than anything else you can do. Spread the science by spreading your happy news about what you like about our shows. And if you dislike us, please email us and we'll work to improve our ways. All right. Yes, please. Now, we're so familiar with NASA's space exploration efforts, but you might be surprised to learn that China launches almost as many rockets as the U.S. They've got their own space exploration program and could soon bring humans to the surface of the moon. So let's give a brief overview of China's space exploration plans, and we will talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. Now, I think before we get into this episode i think it's really important to stress the fact that this is a sampler this is this is a tapas plate of of little bits and bobs and information about the chinese space program you know here we are 700 plus episodes into army cast hundreds have covered nasa activities history missions and so on and there is no way that we can give you anything that is comp maybe we could do 10 episodes and give you a more comprehensive series on the Chinese space exploration plans and and maybe we will but but this is just a high level sampler that is we're going to talk about things yeah. that strike our attention deficit disorder fancy and so we are going to flit around like hummingbirds uh sampling little bits and pieces from what china is is working on and hopefully we will uh give you more updates in the future as this all starts to unfold do you agree do you concur i i, I do i i wouldn't have said adhd fancy as much as desire to rabbit hole with ocd yes but we both have sure. different voices in our brains that's exactly right yeah 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 <laughs> yeah but there's stuff that i'm just like super you know, intrigued by and I obsess about and that other stuff. I'm like, ah, it's just history stuff. I don't care. So, um, so, so I guess, you know, I, like I said in my intro, we are so familiar with what, yeah. what the U S has done. We're so familiar with what Russia done. And a lot of it's because of the firsts, but and China propaganda. is, and, and probably sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but China has been working hard at developing yeah. its own independent space exploration capability. So when did that get started? Um, 
So back in the 1950s, China was working hand in hand with the then Soviet Union to purchase licenses to technologies. And it started with the goal of China wanting to put their own satellite into space by 1959. They didn't quite meet that goal. And in fact, there was a major schism that arose between uh, China and the Soviet Union, the Soviet Sino schism. And that led to them having to do the bulk of the advancement of the work actually on their own. And they didn't really have people who were trained. They didn't have the background. They were starting from, here's something super simple. And now we hate you. So we're not going to tell you the details. Oh. And figured it out with the goal of basically launching things that were bigger from more places than the U.S. and the Soviet Union were doing at the time. It was a slow crawl. They, they didn't go from zero to having all their own communication satellites in a decade, but they worked year after year, decade after decade, to be able to launch extremely heavy things into space from far away from the Soviet border mm -hmm. such that if they wanted to, they could drop things on anywhere on the planet, view things anywhere on the planet, uh, or just destroy anything they felt like in orbit. Right. And I mean, you attempt to create a satellite industry a rocket launching capability but one of the side effects of that is that you are now able to deploy thermonuclear weapons to any spot on earth yeah and so the you know the americans have the ability to launch icbms the russians have this ability this was a high priority for the chinese to join the we can destroy our enemies from afar club yeah and, and this was la largely happening under Mao. And uh, then it kind of came to a stop in the 70s and 80s as there was a transfer of power after Mao's death in 76. Um, and, and so we saw things like their anti-missile super gun got canceled, which I, for one, am glad I did not know about this until preparing for this episode. Anti-missile um, super gun? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was something they wanted to build. Right. Um. Yeah, so, so things slowed down for a while, and the focus was more on uh, a surging demand for communication satellites, mm -hmm. and let's face it, the entire world had a surging demand for uh, communication satellites, um, and they they worked on being able to get things into geosynchronous orbits and just like all the normal, we just want to survive as an economy kind of thing. <laughs> so it went from we shall destroy you and have communication satellites to less destruction, more communications. Right. Don't don't forget we can destroy yeah. you, but also check out our communication right. satellites and weather right. satellites and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think you know this whole. I, you know, because China has always been disconnected politically, economically from the West, they've had to create an entire industry that is separate. A, a, yeah. a copy is one way to describe it. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are like, as they're going to listen to this episode, they're going to be like, yeah, but they stole all that technology. And they stole plenty, uh, you yeah. know, of course. They much of the stuff is very reminiscent of Soviet era equipment manufacturing. Who knows where all of this came from? But um, but they had to come up with their own rockets. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the whole Long March series. They had to come up with their own platforms for crew capsules, which we're going to get into later on. Um, it's a completely parallel rocket industry from what's done in the West, what's done in the US, what was done in the Soviet Union. It's it's kind of astounding um, without being able to have those kinds of connections to the West, how capable the whole program is today. You know, as I said in my introduction, they launch pretty much as many rockets as the US does. Yeah. I don't think people realize that. It's, it's they and SpaceX are kind of neck and neck. Mm -hmm. And 
And when you look at it as China and SpaceX launch similar numbers of rockets, and then there is everybody else, it's yes. really kind of astounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've got this air, you know, f through from the through the sixties, they got their first. I mean, I think their first telecommunications satellite was in like nineteen seventy. Uh, through and of course, developing their ICBM program and communication satellites, satellites. Other satellites. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So one of the things they did early on is they became the third nation very quietly because I know I never and I was like a total space geek. I never heard about this. One of the things they did early on is they became the third nation in the world to launch a satellite, have it do its round and round and round thing, and then successfully come back down and be able to to be recovered so they were focused on building heavy things building recoverable things and and that recoverable really makes sense if you think about how in the early days we didn't really have a good way to do encrypted communications from space to earth and even the u.s was dropping reels of film of images they took of the planet back down mm. onto the planet so recovering an entire satellite is even better and is in fact what we do with the uh, governmental spy plane that we peri periodically see launched here in the US. And I think like the the roads really diverged by the late 90s, you know, there was yeah. some level of integration between China and the rest of the world market, they were launching commercial satellites, they even launched a couple of Iridium satellites. Yeah. And by the late 80s, there were accusations from the United States that, that the Chinese were stealing technology from various aerospace firms. And you got this thing called ITAR, the International Traffic in Arms Regulations. And that prohibited any US-made components launching onto Chinese rockets. And so a American satellite manufacturer couldn't launch their payload onto a Chinese rocket. Had to be anyone else, you know, you can launch on an Arion, you can launch on a rocket lab, but you can't go with China. Yeah, you couldn't and, even sell an Xbox to China. Yeah, right, because they can be used for for missile guidance. Yeah. Was it the was it the PlayStations like the PlayStation? Anyway, it that was, was one of them. Was, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And so you get this this bifurcation where there was some level of integration between China and the rest of the world aerospace market. And then you get this separation. And and the way it happened was extremely smart. A lot of Chinese students would come to the United States for graduate school, would get jobs after graduate school in research centers, would stay in the U.S. for a decade or so, getting really good job experience, bringing value to the United States. And then China would be like, if you come back, we will we will offer you this absolutely amazing job. Um, I, I've seen it happen with some of the grad students that I was in college with that they like essentially fled China, went to mm. school in the United States, lived here for a long time, and then were basically offered complete professorships with tenure and labs and like everything a faculty member ever dreamed of. So this letting their people out to be successful in the U.S. did benefit the U.S. and then China brought them back and could learn everything that these people had learned and transfer that information to their people. And there was spying going on. Spying happens. Industrial oh, espionage yeah. is a thing. We even see it U.S. company to U.S. company. I think you just assume if money is involved, industrial espionage is going to happen. And sometimes it crosses borders. Yeah, and I think... Like that's like there's there's the one where you look at what somebody else has done. Like people say, oh, the Chinese are copying SpaceX. They're copying the way they're landing rockets. Well, I mean, anybody who understands how to build rockets and how to launch them watches a video mm -hmm. of a SpaceX Falcon 9 landing and goes, oh, I know how we could do that. Right. right. And there's no espionage required. You're just like looking at a video going, hey, they're landing rockets. It's a, it's a, that's sort of 
obvious. Yeah. You know, you're someone has done it first and now you're just you're you're doing the same thing. And of course you will. But it's a different thing if you actually get your hands on the software, on the hardware, on the components, all that kind of stuff. And yeah. you actually and and who knows? Like nobody really knows. like I'm sure there are spies there are spies out there. There are intelligence, counterintelligence that people know the the true extent. But I when do not you want at, to know the true extent. Please do not <laughs> tell me the true extent. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. All right. So so I think things took a dramatic turn right at the end of the last century, sort of yeah. leading up to the year 2000. So we're going to talk about that again after this break. And we're back. So let's let's talk about this. You know, it's one thing to launch satellites, to have the potential to launch nuclear weapons around the Earth. But, you know, the mark of a spacefaring nation is to put humans in space. Yeah. And, and so we saw that. In 2003, it, it finally happened. Taikonaut became a word that had a human associated yep. with it. So I'm going to do some, some, is it etymology? So, yeah. so, so this is my Mandarin practice. So Taikong uh, is, means like the most empty is what is what that actually means. So the most empty space, the most empty. And so that the Taikonaut, that Taikong is the is the Chinese word for outer space. And so the Taikonaut, which is I guess like that's not the, the not part comes from astronaut. Yeah, that's how you get the most empty space people explorers is that sort of merging of those words. I like it. We have the Latin root, the root, uh, the Greek root, and the Chinese root. Yeah, all yeah. ending in much Latin. together. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah. So I mean, we, and when you saw that first capsule, it really looked like a, like a Russian, like a Soyuz, yeah, a Soyuz capsule. Yeah, like it was clearly either they bought a lot of parts or had been deeply inspired by that, and so, but go with what go with what works well, first. And, and I mean, the thing is, at a certain level, capsules look like capsules. The U.S. was doing the space shuttle program at that point. They had nothing from us to inspire them. There were plenty of images of the Soviet and then Rus Russian Soyuz capsules. There's plenty of museums that you can walk up and stare at them longingly and learn what you can and take lots of photos. And you start... I mean, even Picasso said that copying is the greatest form of, I don't remember the exact words he used, but it was like. The sincerest form of flattery, I think. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, yeah. And and so, yeah, that it's going to look like the Soyuz. That was what else existed at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's only quite recently that we've seen the dragon capsule being like we shall be dramatically different even mm -hmm. the orion capsule yes it was very different but it wasn't dramatically different so in 2003 was it yeah uh, the first chinese astronaut taikonaut young liwei goes into orbit demonstrating that they can send humans to space and he wasn't going to be the last and along with this joining the nations that have a human space flight, China at this point was also getting deeply involved in the international pursuit of science. They were showing up to the conferences, they were presenting their research, and they were gearing up with the, and I'm going to say it wrong and you're going to say it right, the Shang-Yi series of, of space probes. They, they were gearing up to become the next big nation right. going to other worlds. So, and I really think like you get this point now where the Chinese do decide they're going to kind of go down three separate paths. Yeah. One is a permanent presence in low earth orbit. And that's with their space stations. The second is, is to really specialize and focus on learning how to explore the moon. And that's what the Chang'e series that you mentioned. And then we're starting to see as well, laying down the groundwork for the future exploration of Mars. And already there's been one mission sent to Mars, a rover lander, and, and other plans are in the works for that. So let's start with the with the, the space station and, the, and that sort of continuous presence in low Earth orbit. So 
like the Soviet Union, they they did the initial small orbiting launch a a uh, space station that wasn't for permanent use and expansion. It was just a like happy little space station. Use it, be do the exploring. They got good at that. But now they're working on how do you say their current space station? I'm going to keep saying this to you because I never get to have Is someone it? who can say these things correctly. <laughs> Tiangong? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so I mean, I'm not getting the tones. I'm not trying to get the tones right. But yeah, Tiangong. So, so that uh, is is more in line with the Mir space station, where this is a hub that is designed that they can expand it. They already have plans to add a second docking node to it to keep adding new habitat nodes to it. They are looking to build a permanent residence that is expandable with expansive uh, uh, solar panel power. Um, they they want to be there as the shining, bright, new, awesome thing in low Earth orbit when the International Space Station yeah. finally gets put out of its misery. Yeah, like when the ISS is deorbited, probably by the end of the 2020s. Yeah. And unless a some commercial private space station is launched and is operational, the Chinese space station will be the only permanently occupied space station in low Earth orbit. And they're looking to build international collaborations of their own. Uh, their relationship with Russia is always weird. I'm just going to leave it at weird. Yeah. Uh, they're also working with, with Egypt, South Africa, a number of other nations that really surprised me going down the list. And, and so they're looking to create an international presence in space for the nations that have previously been left out at various points and also have a desire to have their own presence. Mm -hmm. And along with building the International Space Station of their own Chinese origin, they're also looking to create a permanent residency on the moon's South Pole. All right, we're going to talk about the moon in a second, but it's time for another break. And we're back. So let's shift focus now to the moon. And we mentioned they have sent a series of spacecraft. Yes. I think we're up to Chang of Five, which was the sample return mission from the moon. So they've landed landers, they've had rovers, they've done a sample return. And like that's key, right? Because yeah. you demonstrate that you can land softly on the moon, that you can scoop up some samples, and then you can put it into a sample capsule. You launch off of the moon again and return safely to Earth. What does that sound like? <laughs> right? <laughs> they, they're, and they're doing it slow and steady with realistic yeah. timelines. And I, I think the only nation whose timelines we can generally know are within 10% accuracy is probably China. Yes. And and this slow and study is allowing them to do some really amazing science. Shanghai 2, for instance, didn't just go by the moon. It kept going and went to Tauti. Ta, it went to an asteroid I can't pronounce. This is a theme today. <laughs> And and so they're also doing the the flybys, the landing, the we went to one place, now we're going to another place, redirect that we're so used to seeing with US missions. It's it's a slow and steady but constant evolution forward with plans to get humans to the moon by the uh, twenty thirty and a permanent settlement by 2036 last dates i saw all dates are subject to shift right yeah i mean like right now there's a couple of things that are in the works so we've got the Chang'e 6 which is going to be the next landing sample return mission far side from the far side of the moon uh then they've got the Chang'e 7 which is going to be launching in the polar region and it's going to attempt to explore the permanently shadowed craters and then yes. Chang'e 8 is going to be testing whether or not you can use the stuff that you find in the South Pole of the Moon to make water, make breathable atmosphere, things like that. They're going to be testing out, can we actually live off the land on the Moon? And as you said, the goal with the 
human space exploration program is to have people set foot on the moon, like probably as early as 2029. And as you said, with their keep, like they've been hitting their schedule. Like yeah. this is, I guess, one of the advantages of a centralized economy. You just, it's true. You, you know, you, just get you don't get all that chaos of like people choosing different political parties every time. You just, you can have that long term focus um, yeah. for all the downsides that you get with that. Um, now, let's talk about some of the other stuff that's that's coming as well. Um, yeah. So there was Mars. Yes, and they had their. Zurug, Zun, please say these things. Uh, Jurong. I would never have got there from an X. Yeah. Oh, wait. Which one is it? The... Their little rover. Um, or it landed. Yeah, Jurong. So, so, the, so the mission was Tianwen, and the rover is called Jurong. Uh, that's right. It began with a Z, not an X. All yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and it was discovering seismic activity, working in parallel with the InSight lander. Uh, it was exploring a region closer to the poles than most nations are willing to go. And it was the first mission to really perfect the, and we brought something just to use to take selfies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they have nailed the selfie game. Got to admit. like They really have. And Japan's know. totally following in their footsteps. I'm really here for it. Um they deployed a special little camera yeah. while they were in space just so they could get a picture of their spacecraft in space. Yeah, yeah. That's like, what a flex. Yes, it's it's excellent. And and I have to say, one thing we, we, we failed to mention is they are doing all of the science, all of this exploration, all of this human space building up of infrastructure, while at the same time, developing entirely their own GPS network that is separate from everybody else's, their own uh, Earth observing network separate from everybody else's, their own weather satellite network separate from everyone else's. Their own Starlink, their own mega constellation. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so their, their Starlink, as far as I can tell, is still behind Starlink. And it's kind of rude of us to call them all Starlink, like Kleenex, <laughs> but this is the way the world is going. Right, right. Um, yeah, Starlink I'm sure that's, the a, Kleenex that's a brand. Is, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a I don't know, communications mega constellation, yeah. internet mega constellation. Um, so, but, but before we like move on to all this other stuff, I just wanted to mention one thing that I think people should really focus on what is unique about the Chinese rovers is there's one piece of equipment that the Chinese have installed on the rovers that has not been present on any others. And that is a very deep ground penetrating radar. Um, oh. We saw that on the moon missions and we saw that as well on the Mars mission that allowed them to peer down into the regolith for like a hundred meters plus. And they were able to, on the moon, they were able to see down and see the size of the regolith, how the jumbled up pieces of rock grew in size down to fairly large boulders at the bottom of its detection area. And with the one on Mars, they were looking for water, looking for water ice. Is there water ice within a few hundred meters of the surface of Mars? And they did not find any. So, <sighs> you know, at near the equator. And so, the, you know, the purpose of this was like, hopefully it would have found deposits of water really close to the surface. And that would have been great. I mean, there have been other detections of water deeper down, but, but nothing, you know, the, uh, Jurong wasn't able to, to find any. So I just wanted to sort of like set that as a, as a, as a piece of equipment. And we're going to see something kind of similar to that with the upcoming Europa clip mission, which is going to have its ability to try and peer through the ice on Europa and try to figure out how deep the water is down below. It's a, it's such a great tool. I mean, we've talked about this in the past, like they find cities in um, Central America using ground penetrating radar to look through the debris and the and rock LIDAR. and the sand and, and find old pyramids and things yeah. like that. Yeah, it's amazing technology. Yeah. And, and I think one of the keys here is Pre President Xi Jinping has been in office for a long time. It looks like he intends to stay in office for a while longer. Forever, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Moving on. <laughs> he he has really stated over and over that he sees the Chinese presence in space as integral to the strategic plan for a nation 
and their competition on the world stage. And when you make exploration a cornerstone, it enables things that don't happen when you have exploration as just an interest of the nation. There's a cornerstone and there's a national interest and they aren't quite the same. And and so what we see is a desire to try and do things that have never been done. One, one of the things I read about in preparation for this uh, episode that I, I had no idea was a plan is they want to build a large structure in space made of AI powered CANSATs mm. that are working together and can collect debris and do things. And this kind of reminds me of all the sci-fi shows we've seen with swarm bots that like this this was used a lot in Stargate where one of the enemies was swarm bots that could come in and grab things and use their material and churn out new things. And China hasn't put it that way as swarm bots capable of massive destruction, but the fact that they are looking to build a mega structure of swarm bots in space that can collect debris is very sci-fi of them. And right. And I'm going to be watching that now and yeah, yeah, that's perhaps interesting. having an existential crisis this afternoon. And so there's a couple of, of things just like, again, this is a laundry list, you know, yeah. as we're b b flitting from, from flower to flower. Um, uh, they're building their version of the Hubble Space Telescope, the Shuntian yeah. Telescope. And the original plan was to, to bolt it on to the Chinese space station. They really vibrations heat that's a bad idea but it's going to fly in formation with yeah. the space station and then they're going to be able to bring it to the station dock it swap out the gyros and then release it again and that's a very elegant way i think to yeah. to have a space telescope just fly really close to your space station um they're in the works for their own sample return mission for mars and it's likely that they're going to beat the American European collaboration to bringing a sample back from Mars. That's, you know, the, the, the downside. Will. Yeah, the political will. Like, here you go, <laughs> different people with a diverse group of opinions about what should happen and they vote. And it's so troublesome. Yeah, um, it's a game so, of civilization. You always do better yeah. in the game if you're either royalty or a dictator. And democracy right. yeah yeah no and democracy gets results um but yeah. the right and so we should see probably but unlike like with the american version where they've got you know perseverance collecting all these samples putting them carefully in its belly bringing them to a sample return capsule where you know here's the best of the best that i could find it along a 20 kilometer long drive the chinese one will be just dig some stuff nearby and mm -hmm. put it into you know, it's probably gonna have helicopters like the plan is gonna have multiple helicopters as well as a rover as well as digging arms and yeah. it's gonna try and collect as much samples as it can in its in its area and then bring that back to earth uh, they've got multiple missions planned for various asteroids yeah. in the works um and the, the culmination you know we talked about humans going you know the as the plan is a long term it's on the moon and then following that, the plan is to send humans to Mars. Like, what does a sample return mission from Mars look like? That looks like we sending find people out. to Mars and back. Yeah. So, um, you know, whatever happens with the rest of human space exploration, we're going to see this adherence to the schedule from the Chinese as we move through. Uh, and we didn't even talk about, like, like they're, they're extending their reusable rocket yeah. plans. They just tested out a new rocket that looks extre lift. extremely familiar to Falcon 9. They're working on version, their own versions of Starship, fully reusable two-stage rockets. They They're launched building... from a ship. They, they launched, launched a large rocket from a ship. Well, it was a, it was a solid, it was a complete solid rocket. So this is a new thing is a rock, you know, every part of it, the booster, the main stage, the, the strap on boosters, the upper stage, everything was solid rocket, which is very dangerous. Tricky. Yeah. You don't get to turn it off again. No. So see how it works. Uh, but they were able to launch into orbit with a fully, you know, solid rocket, as yeah. you said, launch from a ship and yeah. you know, again, squirrel um, they, they, you know, this solves one of their big problems, which is that they let, 
their upper stages fall or their, their lower stages fall into people's villages yeah, they down have a range with that. from their rocket launch facilities. And they just, they'll tell people down range that they should evacuate because a rocket might be falling into their village. And then they, you know, who knows where it actually lands. They clean yeah. it up and then everybody goes back. Hopefully they didn't get too much hydrazine in yeah. their, in their breakfast. It's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully getting reusable rockets launching from, from ships will mitigate that problem to some extent. So uh, you know what? I, we could, again, we could do this forever. Yeah. Um, but this is like our high level. I, I want to come back around and we'll go in more detail and talk about, say, the Chang'e program or talk about the, the Mars program or talk about their asteroid program or their, you know, all this kind of stuff because each one is a totally uh, interesting conversation on its own. But this is just our random thoughts on the Chinese space <laughs> program so far. So far. Yeah. So far. Pamela, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, existential cri crisis schedules for this afternoon. But first, I would like to thank several of our patrons. We can't thank all of you all of, all of the time. But this week, I get to thank Tim McMacken, Gregory Singleton, Michael Regan, uh, Kenneth Ryan, Scott Briggs, J. Alex Anderson, Frodo Tannen Bo. I think I got it right. Maybe I don't Frodo know. Bomb? Isn't you say that a lot? I, think I have a correction for the pronunciation in the notes this week. Thank you for the correction. Uh, Bruce Amazine, Jim McGeehan, uh, Father Prax, Smansky, Planetar, Glenn McDavid, The Air Major, Lou Zealand, Nyla, uh, Matthew Horstman, Marco Yarasi, John Drake, Scott Cohn, Scott Bieber, Griggy, Georgie, Ivanov, uh, Zebra Lark, Matthias Hayden, David Gates, Justin Proctor, The Big Squish Squash, Cooper, Iran Zegrev, Don Mundus, Peter, Benjamin Mueller, Philip Grand, James Roger, Carney Rassian. Thank you all so much. We are here because of you. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye bye. And then they saved. And then they saved. Giant swarming AI driven camsats. It's such a tricky topic. Uh huh. Because it's so politicized. Uh huh. I'm sorry. It, it's swarming giant AI driven camsats, no matter who builds them. Existential crisis. I don't think so. You did That's... not watch Stargate enough times. I did. I did. <laughs> we, we, I just did an interview with the plans to send swarms of probes to Alpha Centauri. Like, you don't think that's cool? I think it's cool because those are far enough away to not turn and like start treating like debris things that we would like to have in orbit. Oops, I lost you for a second there. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see what the difference is whether it's one spacecraft or like I think having multiple spacecrafts work in a swarm. I'm down with. I'm, <sighs> I'm okay. for it. What? Why do? You, why they're tiny? They're harmless. Like who cares? I don't see how this is a problem. Okay. No, 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 like, please, please tell me so, so, why a swarm of little CubeSats that is like sensors has, so is in any kind of There's problem. They're looking to be able to pick up debris with. So you can imagine a group of swarm bots all approaching something together and moving it around. And once mm -hmm. you have the capacity to get five can sats grabbing something small you can get 50 to move something large like a and, someone's precious satellite right, right right and we we've all seen the sci-fi movies where you give an order like go get rid of all the evildoers and and how does a robot define evildoers how does a robot define debris um you then lose communications. Like I said, I I I have read a lot of sci-fi. Yeah, and like this it, is I get into... haunted apparently by the sci-fi like, I read. If you're worried about robots developing um, capabilities and having a you know a plan that is different from the one that you give it, an objective. Uh, what do they call it? A, an objective function. Um, if you give it a goal or it has a goal that is different from the one that you want to give it, that's a problem. But you don't need to have swarming space bots. You can have, oh, I don't know, 
uh, large language models. Oh yeah, yeah. The large language yeah. models. Yeah, coding yeah. with with the the AI that GitHub has. Mm -hmm. I swear that thing's telepathic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so imagine you you make your program so smart that it figures out and you tell it what you want as its goal. It's starting to turn into a genie in a bottle where uh -huh. you say, uh, I want, you know, I want this outcome or it's like the monkey's paw, right? You're like, I want this outcome. And the AI goes, I will get you that outcome no matter the costs. You're yeah. like, whoa, you, you know, make me yeah. a turkey sandwich, but you can't kill all humans. You know, it's like the, the, uh, the Simpsons episode was like, the yeah. turkey's a little dry. Oh, so um i think i think we are now running headlong into that existential crisis and i don't think you need hardware in space collecting pieces of space debris you need larger more complicated uh ai models with access to the internet released open source where people can muck around with them to make them do things i mean like even like what's happening with the russia invasion of ukraine oh yeah the drone war is has turned next level yeah yeah right like there are now fleets of drones that are launched towards each other these drones can seek out people in foxholes mm -hmm. drop grenades in on them mm -hmm. they can they have enough shaped explosive to take out a tank yeah uh like Oh, extrapolate I'm, where I'm, this is going i'm fully capable of having more than one existential crisis okay. at the same time yeah yeah so 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 imagine your fleet of harmless cubesats gently gathering space yeah. debris for their art projects and then instead imagine that they are drones of coordinated killbots mm -hmm. down here on earth flying through airspace uh dismantling uh, an enemy uh position mm -hmm. person by person popping their heads like I, I i don't know about you but i keep having that that scene from uh the original hobbit cartoon where bilbo goes it's a fifth army it's like every time i turn on the news there's a new army with new capabilities yes and yeah I, yeah and yeah this is like if you want to destroy a million dollar battle tank with a one thousand dollar drone, like it's a it's a good investment in in mm -hmm. defense and in offense. And so, like, let's what does this look like fifty years from now, where these things yeah. have an enormous amount of artificial intelligence that that you can that I, I can't imagine defense will ever catch up to offense in this place. And so one nation decides to send 10,000 drones at their neighbor. So the question uh, is, do we end up in the Matrix or Ready Player One? Well, I think we end up in that that Black Mirror episode with the little bees that are taking people out. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's... the that's the future that I think we, we end up in. Unless there's <sighs> like, like we were able to negotiate um arms control worldwide about not using nuclear weapons on each other we do, we just watched oppenheimer my wife and i uh -huh. and you could see in the end he's like okay i made the bomb now how do i prevent anyone from ever using these bombs again you know he became obsessed yeah. with with arms control and and de-escalation and so we're now entering this realm this time when warfare can turn into this mm -hmm. and the only way that gets us out the other side of this is people having rational conversations about this how this kind of weaponry just can't be used you have cannot you give robots this? guns i know i know i know <laughs> you cannot give robots guns it, you just can't do that do not yeah. let robots have guns yeah. and then let them choose um uh, targets right yeah. like that just doesn't end well like even if they do exactly what you want it's a weapon of mass destruction. Well, and it's that genie in a bottle. A couple of years ago, I remember reading about the military was testing uh, AI-driven drones where they gave the drones the command, take out something. I forget what it was. And right before it was about to follow its command, they sent a 
um, do not fire overwrite. And so the, the AI driven thing could not complete its task. And this was taking place in a computer simulation, not where they were actually destroying things. And so the, uh, AI-driven drone in the simulation decided to take out the communication satellite so it couldn't be told to not right, destroy the right. thing it was supposed to destroy. And that's a little too genie in a bottle, monkey paw, whatever it is. That, I- so that that story that you're saying is mm-hmm. has sort of like Paul Bunyan-esque levels of absurdity from what originally happened. Like it, it was they were running war game simulations with drones da, 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 and the, and one of the commanding officers asked this hypothetical, what if this happens? That happens? Like this was, wasn't a thing that actually happened. Okay. This was a, this was a hypothetical posed within the military about that situation. So, so we have not got, but there are plenty of examples of robots doing things that they weren't supposed to do. There's this, okay. this term called reward hacking. So, um, you, uh, where if the, if the, the drone or sorry, if the, if the AI can figure out a way to get its reward without doing all the intermediate steps, then it will do that. Yeah. And so then, so will a human, so will a human of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. So will, so will corporations <laughs> on the internet, there's corporations in the world attempting to, to arbitrage money from people. They, they will try get to the end without having to do all the hard stuff in between, which you originally intended. And that's the the short term risk that we have is that we give these, this artificial intelligence, this agentic behavior to accomplish tasks. And, and we do a bad job of specifying that, but you're not allowed to, but you're not allowed to, but you can't do that without. And so the, so the robot goes, Oh, like the best way to make sure that I can bring you a cup of coffee is to kill all humans right no no that's you you bring me a cup of coffee without killing all humans oh can i maim all humans no you can't maim all humans right but if there are no humans then then i have the best chance of bringing you your coffee right so yeah yeah and and i appreciate the correction and thank you also misadventure and astro for the correction one of the side effects of reading a lot of stuff is sometimes no matter how smart you are you miss the misinformation Oh, so people were were correcting you while I was correcting you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Corrected on on all sides. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think we've reached the end of our hour. Plus, um, was there any quick questions? Uh, Hal McKinney asks, "I'm going to be getting the Apple Vision Pro this Friday. Uh, are you getting one? You must. Be. You're you're deep in the Apple ecosystem. I, and you I love your virtual afford- reality." I cannot mm. afford that device. Yeah, that, that is that is well far out of my price range. Um, I, it's like three thousand, four thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. I think my husband's gonna get me a Quest Three to match his Quest Three, so that we can have AR battles in the uh, living room together. That sounds good. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, Lionel asks, "Is the weekly space hangout still a thing?" No, it's no. not. No, it's not. Nancy retired, and it was her baby. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you you. You sometimes can't pass someone's dream on to somebody else. It's sort of like <laughs> if Fraser and yeah. I ever retire or die, I mean, either are equally likely, I feel like. Um, it, I, That's no it, astronomy is, cast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I, I think so. I mean, I think um, we haven't really thought about a, what would a... <laughs> sundown um, plan look like? Yeah, yeah. Like what happens if either of us pass away? What happens to astronomy cast? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't think I would want personally. I don't think I would want to. I think that no. would be that. I know yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. 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 I think astronomy cast is just, it's us. It's so, us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people are talking about quitting and retiring and all that kind of stuff. And there will come a day when astronomy cast wraps up and I, yeah, I have no plans. You know, we've we've made it so easy for us to do the work, and we get so much benefit out of it that I can't imagine that we would that we would stop. But there will be day when it, when it yeah. is the last episode of Astronomy Cast. I, I had someone the other day congratulate me on turning fifty and say they looked forward to the next twenty five years of my career. And I have to say, I wasn't quite sure how I felt about that reaction. But hey, we're looking at another twenty five years of Astronomy Cast, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for that prediction. Someone, we, we someone locked see. it in. 
we need to see Europa Clipper science. Yeah, well, so we've you know we've been at it for fifteen years. So if this is episode seven hundred ish, yeah, then we should be close to two thousand by the time we actually wrap it up. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So don't worry, lots of time, lots of space news. All right, let's wrap things up. Thank you everyone for watching us today. Thank you Pamela for uh, toughing through multiple uh, allergies to bring us this episode. Um, is there anything interesting that people should be prepared for watching? Shortly? Uh, I, no, I am still recovering from the allergy attack that I had. Once I no longer feel like a troll on a bridge, then we'll get back to more streaming. Yes. All right. And if you haven't already, go watch my interview with Adam Reese. Yes. It's so good. All right. And Nyack, Nyack, what Ny mm. I look, I, sorry, this is my favorite thing you do every year. Tell us yeah. what Nyack interviews you have coming up uh well i've we've got one out so far i've got inquiries into a bunch of others uh so i've got so many interviews that are queued up right now that we don't even have room to sneak the anak ones out as well i've i've got seven interviews in the can right now for waiting for the editor to be able to process them so uh there's so much interesting stuff i just That's did an awesome. interview today about um searching for life on venus you know the sarah seeger group Planning yeah. to live life on Venus, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I've, so that's that's in the can, in the can. Um, I'm talking to, to David Kipping tomorrow, well, Friday about exomoons, uh -huh. which is going to be fun. Uh, Paul Sutter is back next week with uh, his new book. So, yeah, I'm. Awesome. Uh, so uh, before we go, <laughs> people are talking about retirement, right? All yeah. you know, you know, all these people are retiring on YouTube and stuff, and and you know they talk about how everything is a grind, everything is a for me, it's about following my curiosity mm -hmm. and the interviews and things like that. As long as I get to follow my curiosity, then I don't mind recording it while I do this. So we people get, get to join along. Yeah. To follow our curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are, there's a few rabbit holes that I regret. Climate change, you do not actually want to understand and your spouse does not right. want you to actually understand. Yeah. But like, I... I got paid to rabbit hole on the super volcano under Naples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and so I think, um, like Anton, who's my producer, yeah. he's always going, Oh, you know, we should cover this. You know, people are quite excited about it. Do really well on the, on the algorithm. And I'm like, meh, I don't care. Yeah. You know, I have no interest in feeding the YouTube algorithm. I am not interested um, because that's boring and yeah. I don't want to do that. And so I, I don't have to. And as long as, you know, the assumption that I make is that if, as long as people are interested in the things that I'm curious about, then I should have a career. Yeah. And that's good enough. So no, I could, I could make more money cover. I don't know. Every change at SpaceX. No. Like so many channels, <laughs> but I just, I am bored of that. So no, I'm not going to. So anyway, uh, that's the solution. That's the trick is to not feeling like you have to retire and not feeling like you're overwhelmed or overworked is just yeah. follow your curiosity. Yeah. All right. Now we're going to wrap it up. Thanks everyone. Okay. We'll see you next week. Okay. Mm -hmm.